Well, good, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about 3D cartography today. My name is Andre. I'm, I'm currently a consultant working for a Prague-based company in Melon Technologies. Melon Technologies is a big data streaming and computer vision and deep learning company, which uh, has just recently become part of, uh, of Hexagon Geosystems. Uh, and uh, our topic today is uh, 3D cartography. Um, now, actually, the better part of my talk is going to be devoted to something far more general than that. In, uh, the, the question um, we'll be looking for an answer to is if a 3D mapping is cartography. I'm just going to wait for people to settle in a bit. All right, no? <laughs> okay. So, you might actually have an opinion on this, if 3D mapping is cartography, but while you ponder this question, I'd like to show you something. This is an image of the summit area of Mount Everest, which came out in 1988. It came out as in the November supplement of, uh, in the supplement of the November 1988 issue of uh, National Geographic. And it's got a special personal meaning to me because uh, when I was growing up, I was, uh, I was growing up in Czechoslovakia, of course, National Geographic was very difficult to come by. And when I saw this image at the age of 14, I was immediately hooked into the world of cartography. To me, the, the, the precision, the, uh, the informational value, the ultimate artistic beauty, all this provided pretty much a jaw-dropping experience. This is what I wanted to do, beautiful stuff. Now, fast forward 30 years, <laughs> and we're getting another state of the art. Uh, I took the effort to take the very same, the image of the very same area straight off Google Maps. <sighs> well, something's off here, right? <laughs> you know, uh, like there's not much informational value. Uh, there's no artistic beauty to speak of, you know. And if your jaw drops, it's certainly not in off. It's probably in, in some sort of uh, disappointment. So, so how come? How? How does this happen? How does it happen that after 30 years of amazing technology progress, uh, we're getting from, from a company which pretty much epitomizes the new digital cartography era, a product which you and me are probably going to agree on is inferior to what we saw in 1908. I'm waiting for the people to settle in again, sir. <laughs> Yeah, so how is this possible? How is this possible? And here's the answer to it. What we're actually seeing here is a classical example of technology versus craft. What happens is that whenever a new technology makes a formerly specialized craft accessible to a wider group, there is a massive drop in overall product quality. Now, this is a very generic phenomenon, which you're going to observe pretty much in any field. But in our particular case, 3D mapping is the technology, while cartography is the craft. That's the explanation why we get from here to here. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that 3D uh, that, that 3D mapping or technology in general is something bad, that it should be rejected. Uh, doesn't make much sense, does it? Modern 3D mapping technology, which is normally associated with GIS, TCPIP, more recently WebGL, has actually given us tremendous new possibilities, such as arbitrary viewing angles, interactivity, multi-resolution mapping. Now, this is all good. But the problem is that in a classic case of technology versus craft, these are mistaken for map design, which they are not. This basically means we are using a splendid tool, but we are using it to a very wrong end. Um, 
numerous misconceptions follow from this. In cartography, a map is usually understood as a representation of an area or a depiction emphasizing a relationship between elements of space. While in 3D mapping, uh, a map is mostly orthophotos draped over DEMs. In cartography, a map works with a hierarchy of features, both intellectual and visual, while in 3D mapping, a map aims for data visualization or simply an impression, pretty pictures, no informational value behind it. Um, in cartography, a map relies on cartographic principles, which have evolved in 4,300 years. Well, since 3D mapping, a map relies on applied computer graphics, which has evolved in something like 50 years. Additionally, there is lots of myths around 3D mapping. Myth one, 3D maps are by definition superior to plain old 2D maps. Now, I come from a 3D mapping company, and to be quite honest, we did succumb to this myth in the very early stages. The truth is that 2D, whether your map is in 2D or 3D, is a map design decision subject to map's purpose and audience. And by subject to, I mean less important than map's purpose and audience. And actually, 3D does not fit all or even most mapping purposes. I could elaborate on that a little bit more, and I will in the later part of the talk. Another myth, 3D maps are a new field which only computer graphics and WebGL made possible. This is a sheer nonsense, actually. Like anybody who's seen a Jacopo de Barbaris map of Manis from 1500 can tell you that 3D maps are much part of the cartographic lineage. And interestingly, the prevailing purposes in 3D mapping are cities and high terrain landscapes. So the misconceptions and myths take us back where we started, from this to this. There's got to be a better approach. At least I feel there's a better approach. And I'm going to borrow a quote for this, which comes from a completely different field. Uh, it reads, it really is not a question of technology replacing craft, but the age-old craft taking on the technology of the day. In case you're curious, the guy that uh, dropped this pearl of wisdom produces decorative wall coverings. But that's not important to us. The important thing to us is that applying this recipe can actually take us to 3D mapping products, which are going to stay true to the cartographic lineage. And what it tells us is that technology actually does, it may, can make our life easier, but it doesn't liberate us from the necessity to master the craft which makes map making possible in the first place. And if we do that, we're going to arrive to something which is called 3D cartography. Now, my take on 3D cartography is that the way to get there is following several basic principles. First, we need to define the purpose and audience of our map. Second, we need to check that the vertical element is essential to the purpose. And third, we need to design a visual hierarchy, which is to be going to be consistent with the purpose. Now, rules one or three are general rules of, uh, of uh, cartography, 2D or 3D. Rule two is specific to 3D cartography. And when I talked about the usual cases from 3D mapping being, city, being, being 3D city models and uh, high terrain landscapes, well, these are the two, that usually, the two purposes that usually pass the check. The remaining part of this talk is going to be devoted to a case study which I've created to kind of demonstrate how 3D cartography principles can be applied, and that's a global 3D mounting map. Um, the inspiration for this map is being taken from the information boards which you can, you can find in mountain areas, shown here in the Swiss Alp, and shown here in the Appalachian Mountains of New Hampshire. Following our recipe, the purpose of the map, the purpose of the map that we'll be creating is an accurate and descriptive portrait of Earth's surface, which is going to convey an accurate sense of mountain landforms 
and which is going to respect the relative importance in lettering and visual style. The audience of the map could be mountaineers, outdoor enthusiasts, hikers, backcountry skiers, or simply anybody who wants to learn about physical geography of the Earth. Uh, things will get a bit of a little dance here. So I've created this website where you can find the live version of the map that I've created. You can also find all the source code and configuration. And following the instructions on the website, you can recreate everything that I'll be showing you in a matter of minutes, perhaps hours. <laughs> the technological ingredients for this you need a Ubuntu Linux server, you need a VTS Geospatial, which is a 3D mapping stack produced by Melon Technologies, and you're, be, you're, be, you're going to be using both the backend streaming servers and the rendering libraries from it. Uh, why VTS Geospatial? Well, because I designed it, of course, but <laughs> uh, there's deeper reason than this. Actually, a lot lots more smarter people than me have written VTS Geospatial, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of follows my, uh, my design. Most, most importantly, is, uh, it's f mm, open source software, including the backend components. The entire stack is open source. There is built-in support for feature hierarchies in, in rendering. That's a very rare feature, by the way, as mapping stacks go 2D or 3D. Um, uh, there's possibility to do visual hierarchies through CSS-like styling, and you can get off-the-shelf terrain imagery and OSM data provided by Melon Technologies. So this would be compelling users, uh, comp compelling reasons to to choose it. Uh, in terms of data, the map is based on the Global Sentinel to Cloudless Mosaic. Uh, from the by the German company OXIT, the viewfinder panorama 3 arc second D, and by British cartographer Jonathan DeFranti, that's basically a modified version of S SRTM. And the features come from OSM, made available first by OSM contributors, then by Qualcomm Technologies as part of their vector, vector tile service, and later on by Malone Tech. And there's also a special data set, uh, which is called the Ultras, that comes from a website called peaklist.org, and it's actually the only part of the entire data set which is not entirely free and it's and it's in its origin um, there's five steps to creating a global 3d map uh, first you need the base map second uh, the physical terrain texture second we need to produce the we need to add the lettering for ultra prominent mountains third we get a lot more lettering from mountains and settlements from OSM then we make lettering meaningful by creating intellectual hierarchy, and in the end, we uh, add a visual hierarchy to improve figure ground and uh, legibility. Uh, all these five steps are actually documented on the website I was referring you to in detail, so um, this is just an overview of what needs to be done. For the base map, there's like two technical steps involved. First, we add global DM remote tileset to VTS storage, and then we create a VTS storage view. This basically means editing two text files, uh, running one command line utility and editing a single text file. This is what these are the two steps. Uh, and we get this. This is the base map in VDS inside your browser. Uh, so we get like this 3D globe, uh, which uh, is searchable. And which also quite accurately depicts the 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 Earth's landforms, uh, but it has no lettering. It's not a map. It's just a model of the of the other Earth. It's a base map. Uh, however, this view is important to us. We're going to use it as a test bed. It's the view in the Washington State over Mount Rainier, looking to the northwest towards Seattle and British Columbia. So we're going to we're going to uh, move it from there to the final map. Second step is that we add the ultra prominent mountains, basically downloading the data set, editing three more text files, and we move forward a bit. We get the labels. These are actually the two most important mountains in that view, Mount Rainier and Mount Olympus, so it kind of makes sense. Now we're, get, we're going to get a lot more labels, mountains and settlements from OSM. This involves editing two further text files. And once we do that, we get this. Uh, that looks a lot more interesting in terms of informational value, but it makes no sense actually cartographically, because 
even though you get lots of labels, there's no hierarchy. Basically, there's lots of weird questions like, why has label for Mount Rainier disappeared? Why don't we get a label for Seattle? And we get lots of labels for, for, inferior, for inferior settlements. So, uh, yeah, we need to establish some sort of hierarchy. And uh, basically, intellectual hierarchy, those of you that are familiar with cartography and the map design, you, you know what, what, what intellectual hierarchy is. It basically means that we need to establish an order within our features so that we can tell which features are more important than others and make decisions, uh, like so overlap, o over, uh, solve the overlaps of the labels by the rule of greater, greater importance. What we normally do with mountains is that we establish hierarchy by topographic prominence, uh, meaning topographic prominence is like a standard measurement of the importance of the mountain. There's multiple definitions. Like one of those is that it basically is how much you need to descend from a specific mountain to, uh, to reach higher ground following the Earth's surface. And the settlements we naturally, we naturally organize by, by, by population. We update the style sheets to reflect on this hierarchy. That's updating two text files. And we get this. Now, this might look uh, similarly in terms, of, in terms of the number of labels, but it actually does make a lot more sense. Because now we get label for Seattle, we get label for Tacoma, we get label for Mount Rainier or for Mount Baker looming there on the horizon. This map is fairly well lettered. But the problem is that there is no visual hierarchy. Like All the labels are the same typeface, they're the same size. So the map is informational, but difficult to read. And this is what we are going to fix in the last step. We establish a visual hierarchy. There's a couple of things in here. First of all, we use different typefaces for settlements and for mountains. Second, we use font size to express the relative importance. And there's also more subtle changes, such as that we make uh, the less important, uh, the, the, the lesser labels we make transparent, thus we make them recede into the background. All these are like standard cartographic grids, uh, tricks to make your labels more legible. Um, and there's one more thing that we do. Uh, we improve figure grounds through subtle changes to the base map. What we do to the base map is that we apply relief shading to it very subtly, and we apply a little bit of, of whitewashing. And uh, once we do that, this is our final map. Now we got a clear visual hierarchy. We got something that actually stays true to cartographic principles. And the best part of it is that we get all the benefits of 3D mapping, meaning arbitrary viewing angles, the whole map is interactive, we can move around, <laughs> things make sense pretty much in any view that we might possibly establish. We get multi-resolution, of course. We can inspect the top of Mount St. Helens. And in the end, we can, uh, we, we can get like a nice view of, of the fire mountains of the Northwest from, from low orbit. So this is it from my part. Uh, once again, you can find the live version of the map on, the, on, that, on, on that URL. There's an accompanying website where you can find all the configuration files, source code, and uh, etc. It's a GitHub repository which you can freely fork and play around with. And if you'd like to know more about VDS Geospatial, then you can check out the VDS documentation at vtsgeospatial.org, the uh, other Melontech GitHub repositories, or the Melontech Twitter account. Questions? Thank you, Andre. We have five minutes for questions. If anyone has anything, please ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> good. <laughs> the question is, what does the style sheet look like? Uh, good question, because I got backup slides. <laughs> 
this is actually what the what the what the what the style sheet looks like. It's a it's it's a JSON file. It's a JSON file. Like if you're familiar with the Mapbox style sheets, with the Mapbox GL style sheets, these are uh, the, the, uh, the 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 VTS special style sheets very closely remember those. Remember those. So if you know the Mapbox GL style sheets, chances are that you're going to feel right at home. It's not like one on one one to one. <laughs> Language is slightly different because there's many features in VTS that are not present on Mapbox GL and and vice versa, but this is this is what you're going to be, be looking at. I guess that's it. Thank you very much. I have a question. Okay. Uh, you said that you sold your company to Hexa. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so the question is the open source policy in the future. VDS Geospatial stays open source. <laughs> it's, it's it's released under MIT license, and and the and, and even though Melon Technologies is now part of, of of a global of a global geospatial giant, there's no plans whatsoever to uh, to to close the source of VDS Geospatial. <laughs> Thank you. Can we get a round of applause for our presenter? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>